Welcome to everyone to uh, today's Future of Insurance conversation. Today we're going to be answering two questions. How will the broker evolve, uh, the broker model evolve to suit modern consumer behavior? And also what ratio will play out in the coming 12 months between broker distribution and consumer operated direct selling? I would encourage each of you that is joined or has joined with us today to put your questions in the I Am River as soon as you have them available. We'd like to queue them up in advance of the Q&A portion, which will happen roughly at halfway through the hour. And so before we get going here, just wanted to uh, shout out to each of our participants today. Uh, we have Mark Hardy, who joins us from TD Insurance. Uh, we have Peter Primdell, who joins us from Cooperators Insurance. And we have Anna Fote, who is joining us from Sun Life Financial. And so I'm going to turn it over to each of them, starting with Mark, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a quick little abstract of where we're at today. Uh, thanks, Don, and I uh, appreciate the introduction. So Mark Hardy joining from TD Insurance, uh, lead our uh, direct-to-consumer life insurance operation. And so I'm going to spend a few minutes sort of talking about what we've seen evolve uh, from a consumer-directed perspective, as, as you noted. And, um, Certainly with what's gone on for all of us in the last 12 months, we've seen a, a, a more rapid shift towards digital in general, but specifically from a life insurance perspective, I think it's really accelerated. Um, about four or five years ago, we really started to put our foot down on, on figuring out the direct-to-consumer life insurance experience, what that would need to look like. And digital, we knew at that point was going to form a big part of it. We just didn't know when. Uh, and so making lots of investments in this space, trying to you know, understand that future consumer, look at what kinds of information they would need from a, a consumer directed or direct to consumer perspective. Um, and a lot of it had to do with getting through the education and understanding and awareness, but also from a process perspective. So understanding that the consumer and, and sort of in general and for lots of us, it really needs to have a simple, easy process. Uh, you need to, you know, some of the fundamentals and basics that I think we've all heard and can be harder to execute than we might think, which is get out of the industry jargon, um, park some of our long standing thoughts around what the process needs to look like in order to fit from a risk perspective, but really absolutely focus on the consumer experience and that and how do you enable it. Um, I think one of the the most tangible part that's come out of that for us is sort of a TD as an organization is really focused on a, on a customer service, customer experience standpoint. And where that's helped us quite a bit is we institute real time feedback. So after we have a conversation with a customer or engage with them, we get to hear from them on, on how that went. And that has helped us over five years get us to this point. And so then with what happened this year, as far as COVID, we saw that shift to the consumer and their, not only their interest in digital because they were forced in that change in habit, but also um, from, a, from a life insurance perspective, people became more and more aware of that risk. So you had a, a tandem of those two things come together. Um, and we found ourselves really well positioned with investments we'd made to deliver advice in a digital way from a direct to consumer perspective, be able to uh, finish your entire purchase process online and, and engage with us in that that stand really came to bear. Um, but I think what's important for, for everyone to consider sort of ir irrespective of which channel they're they're going through broker and not have you is the consumer experience is absolutely starting in digital. Um, and some people are choosing to, to go through that entire experience through to the end, um, self-directed in digital. And, and lots of people are um, seeking advice and looking for other elements, but you, that is the starting point, and that's where you want to be if you're you're intercepting that customer and looking to help them in that journey. Um, and the other piece I would say is it is not a short journey for for a lots of people. There is um, a lot of education that goes into this, a lot of um, elements of the consumer seeking out information and support because it's not a category they engage with every day. Um, and I think whether you're a broker or you're in a carrier or any of those things, as you start to consider more and more in the digital age, you also need to consider that we do this every day. Most of your customers do this once every, you know, as they most of them once every 10 years. And so maintain that perspective um, as, as you're moving forward, thinking about your business from a distribution standpoint as a carrier or as a, a supporting supplier in our industry. Wonderful. Thanks, Mark. Over to you, Peter. Yeah. 
There we go. Thank you, Don. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here today. And I hope the audience listening in is, is doing well in these crazy times that we're living in. Uh, I'm going to tell a little bit of a story about uh, the link between sort of the more transformational innovation that's going on at the company and, and taking it to the top of the house in terms of strategy and our view on, on environmental scans. But perhaps, perhaps before I start, I'll provide a very brief overview of, of Cooperator. So we are a cooperative structured organization. We're a multi-line financial services company uh, operating across Canada. So we offer financial services and security through sort of five, five key pillars, um, property casualty. We have a life company. Uh, we have uh, wealth management solutions as well as an institutional uh, asset management arm uh, and a number of different brokerage operations. And collectively, uh, we're about uh, 10,000 employees and, and licensed agents. And you'll see us uh, across Canada through our 600 plus uh, retail outlets. Um, for myself, uh, next year will be 30 years in the business, so I've seen a lot, and it's a little bit of a scary number for, for me, to be honest with you. Um, I spent the last 11 years at, at Cooperators, and, and the last two and a half of those heading up the uh, what we call the emerging business model area uh, within, the, within the company. Um, and as part of that role, I also co-manage our corporate venture capital fund, uh, offering a bit of a strategic lens into that. Um, but to, to align with the topic, um, I thought I'd uh, dive into to the emerging business model area. And, and the story for us really started um, with four or five years ago, um, doing a, an in-depth assessment of our the environmental scan. Uh, and through conversations with our senior leadership group and, and the board, they identified uh, a select number of, of uh, dynamics that were of interest and, and warranted deeper insight. And, and so those topics cascaded down to myself and a few of my peers. And, and sort of through uh, iterations of that work, uh, sort of common, a common theme that arose was, you know, we're dealing with a, a changing business landscape. And, uh, and when we allowed ourselves to, to peer into the future, we saw more changes coming and an accelerating pace. And we felt that that was, that was really going to impact our, our clients and all the stakeholders uh, to the cooperator's story, um, but also ourselves in terms of the, the financial dynamics uh, as a company. And so that really gave us the impetus to get intentional about uh, sort of exploring transformative uh, type innovation. And, and so about, as I said, two and a half years ago, the, the department is, is, was cast and we launched a, a Duo, which is our digital direct-to-consumer arm of the company that I, I suspect many on the call today are, are, are probably familiar with. And, and I was sort of caught by um, sort of the consistency of purpose uh, when I think back to, to the start of the cooperators, which in 1945 really started with, with uh, some farmers on the prairies and, and social pioneers who felt that traditional insurance really wasn't addressing their unique needs. And so they invented a new company, and that is the co-op group today. And Duo is really the, the 21st version of that same mindset where we're, real, we're really trying to see insurance uh, differently um, and so we try to create uh, solutions that are addressing uh, changing and, and unmet needs uh, for Canadians and, and, and the target clients that, that we're going after who are living and working in, in sort of an innovative and, and fast paced uh, digital economy. And if I take that down one level um, in, into some more specifics, what we're really toying with here or, or playing around with is the changing consumption patterns that we're, we're seeing out there in and outside of our, our industry uh, we're seeing how people live is changing. I think about that as sort of the datification of the human experience with sensors everywhere. Um, we're seeing that the work, the changing nature of work appearing, um, moving from traditional employment to more temporary gig or freelance type work. Um, and, and finally, how we move is, is changing as well. I think what's on the immediate horizon is, is, is this idea of of owning a vehicle and, and versus accessing a ride, if you will. Um, we're starting to see the rise of mobility ecosystems and and uh, and finally autonomous vehicle technology is, is on the horizon as well. And so we really just aspire to enable and empower our, our clients and our business partners to to live and succeed in the, in this changing in this changing landscape. And so finally, you know, how we went about doing that is we, it really required us to rethink and, re, and reimagine uh, insurance uh, and sort of move away from sort of the annual cycles, which is sort of embedded into our culture and our technology and everything else, and think about the world through an episodic on-demand type of lens and, and really trying to meet the clients when, where, and, and how they, they would like to meet so we can address those, those uh, largely unmet needs uh, for them so they can get on with their lives. And and we realized when we looked internally to the organization that we had a capability gap. Our technology was not built for that. And, and so uh, this is where we really leveraged our, our 
corporate venture capital side of things. And we found our way to um, Slice Labs, which is an insure tech out of the Ottawa area, very much a global insure tech uh, who had the technology and analytics stack that, that we needed where we could start to get very creative about uh, you know, insurance solutions uh, that we could build on top of that, that foundation. Um, and then we also had to change the processes by which we, we, we evolved our, our product suite and, and really stopped doing the inside out product centric approach and, and adapt the more sort of human centric outside in approach uh, where we're really leveraging the, the principles of design thinking and, and jobs to be done. So, um, so hopefully uh, in this very quick snippets, you can sort of see what, how boots on the ground transformative type innovation is happening in an organization and linking that to the very top of the house. Uh, as, as our executives and, and our board leaders are, are viewing their environmental scans and their strategies and their strategic choices. Um, so I'll, I'll probably pause there, Don, and, and send it back to you. That's great. Thanks, Peter. I'm sure there'll be more questions to come on that. Uh, Anna, over to yourself. Thank you. And Peter, you started exactly where my, my, my mind went. Uh, you know, certainly Sun Life has a fantastic brand in the marketplace. We're really proud of it. But I think the thing that maybe people don't understand is, yes, we are a claims payer um, for certain, um, but we're a huge employer and we are a significant capital manager. And I think those things shouldn't be lost. Um, I wanted to kind of open with the the weight of that responsibility that we feel in a time of crisis. So when I started thinking about this topic, I kind of, you know, everyone's now wearing masks. Overnight, we've made this switch and everyone's doing it for the, the greater good. And I think we kind of put on our oxygen mask when the crisis hit and said, how do we support our employees? How do we support our adv advisors in order that we can support our clients? Um, it, we acted really quickly. Um, and I think that thinking through it that way, the, the responsibility is significant. These are not transactional products. They're critical for people's health and wealth. Um, and we have lifetime relationships with people. So being able to bring to, to the fore some of the, the work that we do every day that maybe isn't top of mind for people, but certainly is top of mind inside Sun Life, um, you know, being conservative, making making sure that we are responsible with uh, capital and really making sure we have the ability to protect a lot of people and it's 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 not a responsibility we take lightly so when we we think about covid you know certainly there was a bunch of challenges that we faced before covid hit no agent wants or advisor wants to spend time on administrative tasks and god knows we have lots of paperwork we really like paperwork what they want to do is they want the age advisors want to understand who to contact, when to contact them, and really the best advisors are mitigating risk, just like we're mitigating risk. So I'm quite certain many clients needed to, to create cash flow, which advisors are able to do. And it's hard in this environment to try to figure out as a consumer or a client how to do some of that work. It's confusing. Um, they're sophisticated, complicated products, um, and not a whole lot seems to be certain these days. So I think when we look at advisors and the next stage of advisors, how can we start helping them reduce the administrivia, eliminate paperwork that perhaps is unnecessary and get them back to doing what they're excellent at, which is helping clients identify solutions to the problems they have. So when you kind of think of it through that frame, then you know we looked and said, okay, we want advisors to spend time with clients. Obviously that's not possible um, during COVID, COVID, but they need to identify goals and figure out a way to solve problems. So some of the, the kind of global solutions that we launched very quickly were things like online scheduling of meetings, um, video conferencing for client meetings, accelerated underwriting to reduce the amount of friction for people that in the middle of a global pandemic wanted to buy life insurance. And then not insignificantly, the acceptance of e-signature versus wet signature. Um, it was something, it's complicated to do quickly overnight. Um, but I think all of this to say, if we can create client experiences in such an uncertain time that make people feel comfortable and confident, that's, that's saying a lot. We're not in comfortable or confident times. So our job is to try to do what we can from where we sit to look after our clients um, and we need to provide the sorts of tools to our advisors so that they can do what they do best. 
specifically, you know, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing in two geographies and then kind of look forward to the future. So in Canada, we're the dominant player in the market. We have deep relationships. We have excellent advisors. So a lot of the technology that we implemented really allowed our clients to continue to have that relationship that they'd always had with their advisor, but just over Zoom or over, like they could reach out, they could book a meeting, they can do all the things that they're used to just at their kitchen table. And just like we saw in medicine, lots of clients really like that. They like the idea that they had this consistent, trusted relationship with an advisor that they've known for years. And in a time of crisis, they were able to continue to connect with that person, that person that they knew, the person that they trusted. So that's kind of how we've looked upon it from uh, the Canadian lens. In Asia, we, we have a massive growth market in Asia. Um, you know, there it's much more greenfield. And the interesting tidbit in kind of looking at the sort of projects that we rolled out, again, in a very similar way to Canada, we had a really different outcome, which was there's markets there that are actually difficult to physically access islands, long commute times. So in good times, it sometimes is very challenging for a physical human advisor to actually meet clients in, in geographies. So a lot of the feedback has been, it has enabled them to go after clients that perhaps they weren't able to do before. Technologies afforded them um, the ability to connect more easily with them. All of this to say, you know, what's the future? Um, you know, I think the question that we all are, are tackling with is how do you design products and services and client experiences that actually serve the needs of clients? I think we have a lot more tools. Uh, we had tools pre-COVID, we launched quite a few during. So now we have a lot more in our tool chest, which is great. But I think I was doing some reading because I wanted to get a sense, not just from my lens, but industry-wide, the percentage of young people. Because I think the argument often is, well, you need to go all digital because of you know millennials. BCG um, published a great report a few months ago. They're tracking the, the experiences and the percentages. And I was, I was kind of surprised. Only 8% of millennials and uh, Gen Xers are executing fully online, 8%. Now that number I bet will increase, but the, number, the, the smallness of the number surprised me. Almost all of them, to, to Mark's point at the beginning of the conversation, are really interested in hybrid experiences. So they love shopping online, they love getting smart online, but oftentimes when it comes to actually placing a policy, they do want advice. They do want that connection with a human. So I kind of will just close and say, a crisis really is a great advisor's time to shine. When things are uncertain, their expertise and their kind of calm hand, I think is what we really need to lean on. So, uh, you know, really, um, real, a real pleasure. And I look forward to the questions that are gonna arise from this discussion. Back to you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate uh, the comments from each of our panelists. We'll certainly get into more of that once we kick off the Q&A. Uh, Microsoft is very happy to be here today as well. As we collectively look to shed some light on this expanding conversation, we've been talking about the future of advisors and agents for many, many decades now. And so great conversation to pull together. Uh, we work with all insurers as insurance is a very critical industry for us across our global organization. And it's important to note Microsoft's mission is to empower every organization and every person on the planet to achieve more. And so if you think about us in today's conversation, that kind of makes us the Switzerland uh, as we both, as we have both the tools and the technologies that would enable each of these different business strategies that you've heard. Uh, we're also a global sales operation of 30,000 employees operating in over 47 countries. And so to be in a conversation around the future of advisors and the productivity of agents is also really important for us as it's critical to our company's success. Uh, you can't talk about advisor innovation without bringing in some broader insurance industry context. And so I'll do that in just a minute. Um, if we think about the pandemic, each of the panelists talked about how we're accelerating in light of, of pandemic. Um, our CEO was quoted in May as having said, we have seen organizations accelerate two years of digital transformation in the last two months. And rest assured in the five or six months following that comment, it's, it's only increased. And so insurance companies are, are They've really thrived, like our panelists' organizations. Um, they're able to move forward with new products, new knowledge, and new ways of reaching out. You've heard some of those examples. 
couple data points coming out of an IDC report last week uh, from Asia. It focused on the recovery in the Asian FSI community, and it suggests that 68% of FSI leaders in Asia will recover from the COVID-19 crisis within six months or less. And of those, one in two FSI leaders, 53% of the total audience, expect that they'll be able to increase their market share despite the pandemic. And so things are starting to turn and, and turn around fairly quickly. Uh, and that's the litmus test, of course, for how uh, things are going to land and, and adapt here in North America as well. And of course, 70% of all those organizations have also said that innovation is a must. There are six major forces of change that are worth highlighting as a backdrop to today's conversation. Uh, we talked about changing customer expectations. Each of us has a point around that. Uh, but the empowered customer are here for good. They're more informed than ever before. They're increasingly mobile, as Anna talked about. They're expecting consistent service across channels. Uh, they're perhaps not as trusting as they once were. They're more used to, uh, and they've been familiar with pay-as-you-go business models. And in a digital first world, customers don't always recognize that you're downloading the risk of the wrong decision to the individual. And so the opportunity for an advisor to play that critical role and simplify a lot of different data points that are coming at them is, is really a great thing. The second piece is, of course, the attracting the millennial workforce. And Anna mentioned that as well. Um, all insurers are looking to attract the new millennial employees. And one of the major challenges that they're going to have is to meet those individuals with the technologies that they're most comfortable and most used to. Uh, in a Deloitte study uh, called the 2021 Insurance Outlook, it suggests that only 4% of millennials are interested in working for the insurance industry. Um, so very challenging number to consider. If we look at that and break it down, it also highlights that the current makeup of the North American insurance workforce, uh, this is as of a 2018 stat, it's made up of one fourth of which would be uh, baby boomers that are reaching the uh, retirement age fairly shortly. And of that uh, number, 31% of those individuals happen to be insurance agents and 24% underwriters. And so there needs to be this injection of millennials that come forward, of course. Um, we talked about the insure techs and fintechs briefly, uh, but non-traditional players are leading the threat of disruption for us. Uh, it's, it's interesting that the increase in non-traditional players uh, has garnered a lot of attention of the younger generations. Uh, it's forcing insurers to appeal to these new buyers in different ways. And uh, Mark talked a lot about the digital first approach that TD is, and, and I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, but another study suggests that only 10% of those insure techs are actually seeking to disrupt the insurance business model. Most of them are looking to, uh, to the point of uh, approximately as many as two thirds, are looking to introduce a solution into specific parts of the value chain for an agent. And so not looking to disrupt as much as they're looking to augment. And so this creates a great opportunity for us as well. We've highlighted the gig economy and the new workforce, uh, new, new examples of, of uh, behavioral insurance, occasion-based insurance. Peter talked about uh, that as well. And a great example, if you're going on an Uber drive, I, I think some of us have all experienced a scenario where we might have considered paying 25 cents for life insurance for the span of that ride. Uh, so great opportunity for, for new uh, ecosystems and new solutions there as well. Uh, legacy system modernization would be the fourth. And it's, it's challenging because there's a lot of uh, siloed data across organizations and system interoperability will con continue to present a challenge. An example of a customer that we worked with in the US, Geico, uh, they migrated off of their uh, 16 mainframe legacy platforms. Um, most of those platforms are used for their sales departments, so tracking you know, sales quotes, uh, reject policies, uh, also their underwriting, marketing, and corporate compliance departments. They move those solutions off of mainframe, you know, COBOL systems uh, into the cloud, and they were able to leverage uh, an opportunity to introduce new digital channels over and above. Uh, of course, we talked as well about regulations and policies that are changing. Uh, Anna mentioned some pieces of the story that's coming out of Asia. Uh, but in Canada as well, digital signatures for Canadian life insurance was non-compliant pre-COVID. And a lot of successful lobbying from folks like Sun Life uh, has allowed life insurance requests to now be fulfilled without wet ink. And so that's a great opportunity for us as well. Uh, the example uh, that I would talk through in Asia is the insurers and the banks came together early. So this would have been probably in the December, January time period uh, from last year leading into this year. And they successfully lobbied the Hong Kong Insurance Authority to allow for non-face-to-face -face interactions. And that led to an insure tech actually building a fully compliant digital platform on Teams. And so they're able to check where the person lives. They're able to do a digital check-in uh, of the individual. They're able to record the conversation. 
all of that over a platform that allowed them to continue to drive life insurance and mutual fund and, and other wealth management solutions. And of course, consumer directed finance is a conversation that's happening around all of us. Uh, it's the Canadian version and Canadian decision around whether or not we would look to adopt open banking. Uh, Canada has chosen the, current, uh, the term consumer directed finance for a reason because it really articulates the fact that the consumer is going to be at the forefront of decisions. What it will mean though is that the government will be telling banks and insurers whether or not uh, they'll allow ownership of access to data for consumers. And so this would mean that insurers would have access to banking data, but fintechs would also have access to insurance data. And so there's gonna be a very strange uh, and new opportunity to modify strategies as a result of that uh, decision, which is coming in the summer of 2021. And finally, technology advancement and enablement. I thought it would be fitting for me to end on this topic. Uh, InsureTechs are helping to, advil, uh, to advance and build this ecosystem. But some other examples, if you look at core technologies like Microsoft Office, you have automatic subtitles, uh, you have voice transcription, and you have translation across both the Teams platform for collaboration, as well as across the Office products themselves. And so if you're an advisor, you're in a situation where you might be trying to reach out to new audiences. And uh, with the example we just recently brought in uh, French Canada uh, as a translation capability and so you now might not even have that language of choice in your Ballywick but you'd still be able to, to meet someone in that particular capacity. Um, of course we've added a bookings app within Teams as well which makes for a really flexible appointment schedule and digitizing paper and automating paper processes as Anna discussed is obviously top of mind with our knowledge uh, mining capabilities and some of the deep learning. And finally chatbots, a great example from Progressive Insurance they introduced a flow, which is a chatbot to help offload some of the traditional Q&A. And each of us today will talk about how we need to give those advisors more time to simplify the complex for their customers and drive that high value transparent conversation. So without delaying us any further, let's open up this conversation to our participant Q&A. Um, and before we go there, just for those folks that, uh, that are sitting on the panel, uh, please introduce your questions. Uh, there's a series of folks that are checking that for us and they're bringing it up through the stream so we can get to those questions quickly. Uh, and so please put your uh, questions out there and we'll look to synthesize them as uh, often as we can. And so first question, I'm going to turn to Mr. Hardy. Uh, Mark question, wondering if you've noticed the difference between where advisors with the human touch have increased in value. Are there certain demographics that you've seen? Are there certain products? Are there certain points in the process? Yeah, no, no, I think it's a good question. So more of an anecdotal answer than a scientific one on this. And I, I think for for sure where we see it is um, a, a lot of people make it a lot of the way through the process, right? So uh, you know, even even more so than before, we've seen a lot of uh, for all the same reasons we talked about, a consumer level of education, their interest, they're diving more deeply into this, even getting into the application flow. What we do see is you sort of they get almost to the end of the process and then want a second opinion, almost type thing, or, or confirmation that they've done it right. In, in you know, majority of the cases, they're absolutely right, they're in the right direction, everything is fine. It's just how do I have that extra level of support to say, okay, I've got someone who uh, I can explain my situation and understand, and it's not just relying on my own education. I've got this second uh, second opinion there to do it. So that that for sure is the place where I think think it is there. Um, and I, we've we sort of talked about it before. Like you you have consumers who are educating themselves before they enter into a conversation. So it's not like they're sitting around waiting to be taught the basics. They want to know that before they sit down with someone, before they have a conversation. And so that I would say the the anecdotal feedback for sure, and sort of what we see from result is the confirmation that I made the right choice and I picked the right coverage and amount. Great, thank you. Um, this is a question for all panelists. I'll start with Anna first, um, but how can an agent improve the quality of communic uh, communication to their customer and how has COVID altered that evolution in any way? Well, I think the I think it's 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 challenging, right, for advisors because some clients want to be communicated to a lot, others not at all. <laughs> and then in times of crisis to try to figure out who's in what camp because <laughs> it might change uh is no easy feat. And so I think there's a lot of work that we're doing to help them start to identify some of those patterns. Peter talked about kind of the datafication of everything. So moving from like a gut feeling 
to more of a data-driven decision, being able to decant their list of, of clients and say, even though Mr. Smith has the largest portfolio uh, you know, in my book, he actually has weathered storms before, he's good. Uh, but maybe there's a newer client with a much, much smaller portfolio that has the potential to grow to be massive that in fact requires a call and some handholding. So trying to get the balance of that right, I think is the main job. And then there's, I mean, there's a million different technologies that facilitate that. But I think getting to how do you interact with your book? And then how do you interact on an individual client basis? And then what do you do when everything changes? Um, it, I, I don't envy the position of advisors. I'm quite certain they've been running off their feet trying to serve the needs of their clients in the best way they know how. Peter, uh, perhaps over to you. How can agents improve quality communication? I, I think it's having, a, just building on what Anna said, having the information available, right? Having, uh, understanding what, uh, what they're dealing with at that moment that they're coming to you, um, having, first of all, a suite of solutions, having the, the right communication tool so you can meet them over the medium that they choose to uh, to want to meet you. And, and sometimes that's risk dependent. Sometimes it's it's something fairly innocuous. We think of it as commoditized type risk uh, where perhaps a digital solution meets best. But but I've also been working in the world where you have a million dollar account, commercial account, and, and that lends itself to a, a deep conversation, perhaps uh, some other tools that you can bring to bear, whether it's loss prevention tools, analytics, um, and whatnot. So it really, it's really, again, starting outside in, who's asking, what are they asking for, what depth of information do they want, and then finding uh, the right tool in your toolbox to either guide them towards a digital solution or engage them in a, in a conversation and with perhaps some, some add-on research or development work that, that you've been able to do because oftentimes you are the larger organization uh, that you have access to, to more tools in your toolbox, essentially. That's great, thank you, Peter. Mark, how about yourself? How has COVID altered the evolution of, I guess, digital communication from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, and, and so what I would say is the, the you know, certainly all the things from a self-exploration and, and to a more informed consumer. So A, to have that in mind when we're interacting with them. I think the the two other pieces I'd, I'd call to that is um, that advisors when they're talking to clients again it's this it's very infrequent from a customer so even if they're deep into the research this is something they do very infrequently so it's an opportunity for you actually to slow down right as an expert i think it's easy for us to get into like we know all these things and and let me show those to you it's it's for most consumers it's a more basic fundamental need of of confidence and so how can you deliver that and so the first step is is to slow down um, and then specifically from a digital standpoint, we've, we've noticed with things like uh, digital chat, there, there's also a segment of customers who really don't want to call. They're very comfortable interacting with a human, but not necessarily wanting to interact from a phone perspective. And, and so they'll even indicate, look, I wasn't going to call you, but since you have chat, I'm happy to have this sort of conversation. Um, and so we need to recognize that and support customers you know, that, you know, certainly something that's evolved more recently, but that applies equally to life insurance or any other sort of insurance product where I want to do it. I want to do it here. This is convenient for me. This is how I want to do it. Um, and I, but I do want a bit of that human element to support me in it. Great. Thank you. Um, question for Anna. I'll go back to Anna with uh, Sun Life having operations in the U.S. The, the question was, how do agents and brokers differ in their approach when you compare U.S. and Canada? And are there any learnings? So we run a very different business in the US. Uh, so there's not a lot of learnings, unfortunately, because it's uh, stop loss. So it's a, an employer sale, not to say there's no learnings, but it's just a radically different business um, than we have in Canada. So we have three major markets and <laughs> the fun, <laughs> the reason they pay me to show up every day is they're very, very different from one another. You know, we have a big position in Canada. We Asia is a huge growth greenfield and the U.S. is really stop loss. And so, you know, where I sit in the organization in digital transformation, we're really looking at are there common fundamental tools that everyone needs across the world? And then what actually is unique to markets that require different sorts of technology to, to basically um, execute the business that they're in? I, I wish there was more learnings. <laughs> I'm always trying to ask questions and get smart. No, all good. Um, Mark, perhaps over to you. TD Insurance obviously would, would span across the border as well. Any uh, comparisons that you would draw between the US and Canadian market? 
Uh, yeah, so from an insurance perspective, not really in the in the U.S. per se, I think, but uh, sort of sitting and, and watching lots of the things. Uh, I think we're sort of more broadly from a TD perspective, the the human element has been sort of reinforced across. So even the 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 unexpectedly human is sort of our tagline in the U.S. And I think that speaks to where we as an organization fit, and I think what consumers are looking for, which is. I want all of my digital stuff and we want to be really, really good at that. And I want to have the availability of that human element from for all of my financial services. So uh, I think from a, I think more commonality than anything in there. Um, if I was, we obviously spend a lot of time looking at the US market from a direct to consumer standpoint, along with the UK and others, because it's in uh, sort of different states of evolution. Um, you know, the, the advantages from the U.S. from a data perspective can't be understated from versus a Canadian life insurance. So the, all the things we want to do and would love to do to make purchasing easier and better are, are sort of contrary to some of the data challenges we have. But they're also, you know, as an individual, as a consumer, I also like them. So um, my, my business hat is super frustrated. My personal hat is, well, I'm, I'm really quite comfortable with it. And so how do we find our way forward in that? Um, and because and you always want to deliver that better consumer experience. But I would say that's sort of the biggest uh, difference there. And that, that's going to translate to an agent as well, right? They get access to that easier purchase process because of those underlying things. So it's a little more of a struggle here from that. But uh, I think, you know, broadly, lots of carriers have done a great job of trying to find the right way to straddle the better customer experience with that lack of data to get to a good, or a, a reasonably strong consumer experience or best as we can do at this point. I think without introducing specific stats, I, I can confidently say that the broker scenario in the Canadian ecosystem continues to have a, a much longer opportunity for the future. There's a lot more geography in Canada, of course, there's a lot more rural elements. And if you think about each of you on this call has a branch location or an office that's sitting on Main Street and King Street in some of these rural locations, and that's a real interesting and opportunity from a community perspective. COVID has really brought us closer to our communities. And so there's an opportunity there to continue to expand that the direct to customer experience as well. Uh, so thank you for that, Mark, that was great. Um, just turning it over to uh, another one here. I think um, maybe we'll start with Peter. Is fully digital the way forward? And we're not still doing it as an industry we're, and we're driving by consumer demand or need for operating costs. Uh, and so have have our clients changed this year and is fully digital the way forward? I don't think it's it's fully digital in terms of the interaction with the client. I think it's a mix of things just to our conversation prior, right? There's, there's many different uh, preferred mechanisms of communication that our clients have. There is a there's a scale of questions down from, you know, fairly easy and simple questions you can you can clear off in two minutes and, and some more complicated ones that require in-depth analysis to actually provide a meaningful answer to the client. So I see it more as a, a spectrum uh, rather than a binary question and it's understanding where on the spectrum uh, the person or the client is and, and the nature of the problem exists. And, and so for us as an organization, uh, we really wanna position ourselves to meet the client in their through their preferred channel, uh, offering the right solutions um, in in relation to the question that's being being asked of us, and and uh, so so uh, so I think that's the challenge we're dealing with as as uh, insurance companies on this call, right? That's uh, you almost have to be multimodal in that instance, right? You have to be able to service them in a m number of different arenas. As you know, I, I mentioned earlier, this is next year will be my 30th year in the business. It seems like when I started, it was much easier. There was sort of one way and it was very linear. The environment today is, is it's, first of all, it's changing not by year, it's almost changing by month. And, and you, you have to service uh, many different aspects through many different mediums to adequately meet uh, the clients uh, where they need to be met. So uh, it's, it's a complex question. There's no, there's no question about that. Yeah, very much so. Um, question that was asked, I think it was in relation to the quote that I had from our CEO talking about sort of two years of transformation, two months. And so the question coming forward is, why haven't we done two years innovation in two months before the pandemic? And so perhaps each of us can take a shot at uh, answering that. And then the follow on to that is, could we go another two years worth of innovation and if so, what would each of you like to see in terms of consumer experience changes? Uh, so why don't we go with Mark? Why don't we start with Mark first? Yeah, so the, the, we'll start with the why haven't we? And I think it's, 
uh, sometimes you need a crisis, right? It's sort of that's what brings things forward. And you, uh, I don't think the the two years worth of stuff were brand new ideas. It was things that were, you know various organizations have been noodling and knew that they needed to do, um, but didn't necessarily have the impetus. I think that's one. Um, I think the other piece, and, and you highlighted it, is you know as much as uh, we want to do a number of things, there are also regulatory and other reasons that are underpinning this that need to move along with it and. Um, the, I think what this crisis did was actually move some of that uh, that forward quite a bit to enable us to get there because it was sort of the, a, a necessity at the end. So I think that's um, that's what I would put as you know a, a big part of the innovation. I think the other one is um, on that. Sometimes there's lots of uh, shiny object innovation, um, and and it's interesting, and you really want to do those things, and and but I. It's not necessarily always consumer driven. It's sort of thinking about things from how, how you know, us as experts in the industry, like, wouldn't it be neat if you could do these things? But um, nobody's really asking for them sometimes. And so that's the other piece. And we tend to get a little bit into that zone. Um, if, if I said like two more years of innovation, I think the continuing focus on the end consumer, I think every single uh, organization has put forward that focus on the health and well-being of their employees and, and by virtue their the consumers at large. And so I think continuing down that path and being able to support consumers and having confident outcomes and um, like philosophically, I think insurance and life insurance as part of a plan is much more prevalent now for consumers. And so how do we continue to imbue that trust amongst Canadian consumers and, and continue to deliver where, where we've been? Like I think, you know, it's not as, uh, as sexy an innovation theme, but I think that's the underlying thing that's going to sustain us into the long term is delivering for the end consumer what they're looking for building on that trust that uh, we've all you know put so much effort and work into advisor carrier etc um, and, and that's going to be the place where it comes through and so what that means specifically we'll we'll sort of see um, but that's the the theme I think we should be focused on for another two years get it. Uh, necessity is the mother of invention we've heard that phrase a lot and so it, it lands very well uh, Anna perhaps over to you um, can we go another two years worth of innovation and what would you like to see in terms of changes to the uh, consumer experience so I think it's it's hard uh, I'm a design thinker in an IT organization at an insurance company so I like to ask the question often um, so it, like why do we do it this way and you know Peter raised this this point and Mark has alluded to it as well we have a very refined analog way of doing business that has worked for a very long time. And so that it's a very deep groove in the record. And so, you know, one thing that I sometimes say that drives people bananas is that's not a process. That's just the current way we do things. Like, and it's kind of evolved over the over time, but it, it's never maybe been a thoughtful process. It's just the way it works. And so when you start to think about digitizing things, you, you actually need to know how the process is supposed to work <laughs> because you don't have the great advisor who can, you know, fill in the blanks or if something falls off the, and, you know, Mark probably lives this every day, a great advisor can, can make a great experience for a client regardless of what's going on behind the scenes. The minute you remove that advisor from the equation, uh, you better be sure that you're getting it right because it's going to be really obvious if you don't. And it's hard for people to imagine a different way of doing it because it's been a certain way for so long. So I think, you know, necessity is a mother of invention. Why didn't we do it before? Because it's, it's actually really hard for people to reimagine a different process and then build tools. It's very easy to say, I'm going to go procure the software. And that's why you see so many of these things fail because people haven't done the groundwork to say, all of these things need to coexist. So we're always gonna have clients that are gonna to wanna to sit down at their kitchen table with their advisor when COVID goes away. We're gonna have people that want to only interact digitally. And all of those experiences not only need to work on their own, but they need to work in collaboration with one another. So it's actually a not insignificant amount of work to do it well. Um, it's easy to do it poorly, <laughs> but it's hard to do it well. Um, my hope for the future is that we get to some version that is responsible. Um, you know, I echo the other panelists' point around the lack of data in the Canadian marketplace, but it, that too is tricky. So some version of like a digital identity that allows consumers to opt in and opt out, um, I think balances for people that want to opt in, we can create an experience for them. For people that don't, we can respect that. Some version of that I think is gonna be fundamental to moving forward faster. Thank you.
And Peter, to yourself. Yeah, I very much agree with, with Mark and Anna's point. I'll maybe come at it a little bit differently and I'll look at it through the risk and return lens. Uh, I think innovation inherently has the returns coming at you uh, in, in a distant future as opposed to the near future, right? And so, so I think that's one challenge. And then it's inherently a risky journey where done right, you're, you really start with a, sort of a lot of exploratory work um, before you can conceptualize an idea and conceptualize a business model that may work for you. And then you need to engage in the hard work of actually experimenting with a client. So you have to make sure that you're creating sort of um, um, desirable solutions for the client. You have to make sure that you can assemble the technology and it's feasible to do that. And then you have to land on a viable business model. And then you take that idea and you you walk it upstairs if you will and try to gather support for it and try to get prioritization of investment in terms of not just dollars but resources and people uh, in behind it um, and 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 senior leaderships are sitting with a portfolio of things that they're being asked to invest in and so uh, emphasizing something with a longer horizons and a higher risk associated with it um, really requires a different lens and or, or it's a tough decision for senior management to make, particularly when managing the present is already difficult as it is. And I think, so back to your original question, why were we able to do something in two months that we've taken two years? I think it's unlocking that equation where we started to see uh, enterprise risk bubble to the surface. If we don't do this, we have an elevated list or risk. And so, so the scale shifted a little bit and yeah, absolutely, let's do that innovation. Um, and I don't know if things have calmed down, but if, if we go by the assumption things have calmed down and now we peer two to five years out into the future, I hope it doesn't boomerang back and, and we shift that, that scale again because the enterprise risk is very real. There are some elements of what's unfolding above the organi above organization, above industry that would suggest that if we don't do it, other industry sectors may just do it for us. And, and so, so there's a different level of enterprise risk. And so I think it always, sort of gets back to that very risk and that fundamental idea of risk and return and that means different things to different people each come each of our three companies have very different perception of what that means um and and so sometimes that can act either as a tailwind or, or a headwind to uh to innovation uh, and a crisis as you said is the mother of invention and things flow very quickly and resources flow very quickly into in, into various elements of that, including the work from home posture that we're all sitting with today, right? So, Exactly. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I thought the moderator role wouldn't get asked direct questions, but apparently not. <laughs> so there's one here for me, which is um, curious what you've observed from a global perspective. COVID had uh, accelerated many digital journeys, but wondering if you have an example of opportunities that this has created for Microsoft's insurance clients. And then the following is whether that's a data project, a new market, new product development, or digital adoption of products in flight. Uh, and so, so thank you to uh, whomever posed this. I think um, the interesting piece about it is we've all talked about the acceleration of digital transformation, and we've provided examples how technology is allowing that to occur. The holy grail in this particular space from a captive agent perspective is to have something like a data insights hub something that gives you a 360 degree view of your entire business. And in parallel to that, you're actually aligning that to certain evolution points on a customer's journey. And so the conversation around you're partnering with that individual from the time that they first make, they open their first checking account or they introduce their first life insurance policy, you find out through social channels that they're going to be having a baby shortly, which is uh, something that's close to home. Uh, and so you're able to capture some of those moments and introduce very relevant pieces to that conversation dialogue at that time. And so I find that the, the first portion of that journey has been we need to get all that data into a single common place. And that unto itself is a challenge, but beyond that, how do we then take that data and ensure that it's built up on a common taxonomy such that we can introduce other data alongside that? And so it's one thing to say, we're gonna take consensus data and Facebook data, we're gonna mash that up with our on-premise structured databases where we have policyholder information. It's another thing to actually do that. And so what I found is that in the past, everyone always looked at this monolithic application or this monolithic environment and said, wow, that's gonna to have to be the lowest of our priorities because we know the price tag to get there, it's gonna be exponentially high. And there's new thinking now to say, hey, if this pandemic has taught us anything, 
this could be the reality of the future world that we live in. And so we can't avoid those decisions, whether they be you know, big and meaty, we have to start thinking of them. So whether you're skinning on top of a structured environment and creating a digital ready go-to-market brand as Mark and Peter have talked about, uh, or you're at least just understanding that the principle of getting data into a common place so that you can at least start that journey is really important. So I think the data project is really critical because regardless of what age of advisor you are and in which particular modality you happen to be working within, it's going to be really important for you to capture uh, uh, the simplicity of the experience. And we all talked about that in, in particular on this one. The more that you can simplify some of those complex scenarios, the more that you can de-risk. You know, if you go A, it's going to cause this uh, result. If you go B, it's going to introduce X result. That's a really, really important and powerful thing. And that data insight is really how it's uh, coming together. So thank you for that. Um, I've got a spicy one for each of you. And so it, it was also probably triggered from one of my data points. And so the question that's posed here is, uh, four percent of millennials has to improve <laughs> exclamation mark um, how would each of the panelists entice a room of graduates to take this career move into insurance uh, do you see most millennials seeing insure tech startups as far more attractive than the big carriers and so let's uh, each have a dialogue so i'll start with uh, peter perhaps on that one and work around that's a that's a great question um i i, I think Probably my sales pitch to a to a graduate class would be insurance finds itself here today. It needs to get to look something like this in the not too distant future. And we need your talent to help us get there. Uh, and your talent will be supported by uh, sort of insurance deep uh, expertise uh, surround that. But we need a new lens uh, by which we engage the clients of the future. Uh, and, and we meet you in the moments that you want to be met as a, as a client. That's a big challenge for us. And, and so for, for a new cohort coming out of, uh, of school, uh, if, if they get excited about that challenge, I, I think there's something for them to, to bite into here. Whether they go and, and join a, an existing uh, or incumbent carrier or an insure tech, um, I, I think they can both work for us, right? So we, we talked earlier on the call about uh, insure techs being less about disruption, which was the initial story coming out four or five years ago, and actually being a tool of augmentation for incumbents through partnership creation. So I think either way we benefit. Um, I think it just perhaps depends on the type of employment journey and the type of opportunity that, that um, a young person is looking for. It's perhaps a, a bit of a higher risk journey to join an insure tech in, in, in hopes of they're probably hoping for a pot of gold at the end of the journey and so a bit of notoriety. It's probably a little more stable at an insurance company. Um, but I think both journeys could be very, very rewarding. And uh, I mean, we're all biased on this call here, but insurance is a fabulous industry for somebody to get into because you can explore so many different domain areas uh, to build your, your, your personal and professional capabilities as a young person. How's that for a sales pitch? <laughs> well, I think we're about to hear two more. So, uh, Anna, why don't we why don't we spin it over to you next? Well, I I think that we just need to talk about the opportunity. Like, I think that mostly we we don't in a in a in a way that speaks to the sort of people that we're looking to attract. I spend an inordinate amount of time with some co-op students and. I think for me, what I do, and we have a great retention rate because they come back and work for us, the good ones, because uh, that's what we want, is to actually give them meaningful experiences. And I don't think that's that's just an insurance issue. I think that's a new grad issue across all industries. Big companies forget what it's like to be 22 years old and not actually know what the heck is going on in the organization. Um, it's daunting, and so and especially a big company. Because, you know, there's layers and there's politics and it, it's hard to navigate. So what I, it's a very simple thing I do, but I just bring them to meetings and let them listen. And then after the meeting, explain to them what happened in the meeting. <laughs> and get them in on projects where they're not just building slides, but they actually understand why we're doing some of the things. And doing a lot of, you know, Alan Porter's our, our new CTO at Sun Life. And he is such an asset because, what does he call it? Alan Porter School. And, you know, he sp spends time with it because he was in cyber before and recruiting for cyber talent at an insurance company is very challenging. And so he would hire people that perhaps you wouldn't think would fit that role and then nurtured the heck out of them 
and he, you know, the team's rocking and rolling. So I think making what we do meaningful and understandable, explaining the opportunity um, that they have at a big company, um, and then when they get here, actually spending time with them and helping them understand, because it, it is daunting if you're a new grad. Excellent. Mark, over to you. Uh, yeah, no, and and sort of a favorite question. I spend uh, a lot of time with uh, kids. There were kids. I don't know, kids, people, uh, young adults that are in university. So kids is not the right word for that. But um, uh, you know, and and I think a lot of things very similar. I think the two that I would say is like number one, um, demystifying some of the insurance stuff. So you know, with whether it's commerce grads or other other kids or other folks who are in their undergrad or doing their MBA or, or whatever, it's they haven't necessarily engaged with our industry because they're not at a point where they're going to, right? So they sort of think of insurance in the pure, more purely in the auto sense or uh, maybe a little bit from a, you know their parents' benefits, um, but don't really know much about it. So it's, it's almost the, why does our industry exist? Um, and, and a lot of them find that really compelling, right? When you get down to like, here's what we, here's what we really do. Like there's a lot of stuff and you know, actuaries and, and other things going on, but at the end of it, this is a, a an industry with a wonderful purpose that really supports people at very challenging times in their lives and has other um, places and and that that's really compelling sort of uh, for anyone but I think also for that group um, and then the second piece and and, and Peter talked about this too is like what would you actually be able to do and how can you make an impact in supporting that right so important to know that that you know there's a big why we as an industry add value our individual carriers do that. How do I make an impact impact in delivering that? So the work, not only does the purpose of your organization need to be meaningful, which I, I you know, we are all in that place. It's the work that I'm doing has to be meaningful and contributing towards that. And how do I connect those pieces? Um, and then the last one is sort of one, like, uh, and knowing that a variety of opinions, perspectives, and diversity is valued at your organization. I think, you know, um, we, we're all in that boat and we feel that that's an important element of our businesses. We need to make sure that that is demonstrated for that group as well. Um, and they're going to know, right? Like, I think that's the other part. Like, this is also a group that you can tell them all the stuff you want to know. They are going to have ways to validate it. Just like our, we talked about consumers, this is the same place. So if you think someone is checking out your life insurance company reviews online, they're doing the same thing from an employer perspective, right? They're indeed Glassdoor, whatever, um, and their colleagues and friends, they're that, like, they are using all of those networks. So what you say needs to be authentic to how you deliver it, right? So your purpose, how you deliver that, the work that they do, they're going to check with their colleagues and how you say you approach things from uh, sort of a greater good perspective. All of those things have to be 100% authentic because you will get called out if you're not. Agreed. Thank you all. Uh, just watching our time, we have three minutes left here before we close. And so thanks, of course, to the audience for having joined us today. Uh, but just one quick question. We'll go around, perhaps, if you can think of maybe a 30, 45 second response. Um, the e-signature example is a great one what, that will help further our digital efforts. What regulations would the panel like to see change that would impact brokers uh, or agents to be more successful in the client experience? Peter, how about yourself? Uh, that's a great question. I, 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 I'm going to take it up a level. I think, I think what we're starting to see with the regulators is moving to a principles-based environment as opposed to a rules-based. And I think that's a really important dynamic because um, it'll shape also market conduct rules as well. And so as long as you're living by those principles, it allows innovation to flourish in there. And the nature, so the, the specifics of innovation is really what I'm staying away from here. Um, because I think we'll leave that to innovators. You know, we have three companies represented here. There's many multiples out there that can be very creative in that space. But I think the job of a regulator is to provide the environment, environment to allow that in innovation to flourish while still maintaining uh, market conduct rules uh, that's, that is viewed through the lens of a client to ensure that things like privacy and security and whatnot are maintained by these clients. But let's let innovation flourish so we can create frictionless, seamless experiences for the client and give them access to the important solutions that we as companies are able to deliver. That's great. Thank you. Mark, over to you. Yeah, and something with that uh, Anna said earlier sort of struck with me as we're talking through this, which is the you know the from a from a regulator standpoint, how do they take the same type of thought process that Anna takes with her team around? Like that's not a process, that's just a thing that you've been doing for a long time, um, and and I think it ties in with what Peter's saying around the principles, right? So 
as you're looking through these things that you know generally regulators are looking at it and saying how can i add or subtract from the paper i already have what what is your clean sheet approach that says you know that's 50 60 70 or 100 years of built up edits um what were we really trying to achieve how do we get back to that i mean maybe that's a bit of a uh, hope, and a, hope and a prayer, but I think that would be the one for me is to say, you know, even just pick one place, go clean sheet and say, what did I really want to accomplish from a regulator standpoint? And, and at the end, I think it's the proper treatment of consumers, stability of, of an industry to make sure that that gets delivered and, and whatever. And then and as you apply that to any particular area, that would be the right approach. Great. Thanks, Mark. Before I turn it over to Anna for a final word, just wanted to thank uh, our, all of our participants, of course, uh, that joined us here today and the panelists. Anna, Peter, Mark, uh, really appreciate the time and energy that you brought from on behalf of your organizations. And so, Anna, over to you. If uh, Last word around um, our efforts in, uh, in moving forward with the digital and compliance world. I would kind of echo what Peter said. If you kind of take it up a level, I think fundamentally our business is different than some other businesses that have been disrupted. There's a reason that we are required to hold a pool, a pool of money. There's a bunch of reasons that we do the things we do and we take that uh, seriously. And so I think we do have the ability in the market um, to, and we have behaved ethically. And, and um, so th just this idea that we, um, we have the ability to do things and we should innovate within rules, um, but the, the risk of us breaking the rules from a reputational risk or just uh, not delivering on our promise to our clients is very mitigated because of the amount of, of float and pool of money that we have. Um, so just to, to, it's a bit of a balance, meet, meet us halfway, right? Like innovation needs to happen, responsibility needs to happen, and I know that there's a middle ground we can get to. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Uh, that ends our time here today and uh, appreciate everyone joining again. Hopefully you have a wonderful and, and happy holiday season. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.